Well, the Bible reading today is from Colossians chapter 4, verses 7 to 18. Uh, you can follow along in your pew Bibles at home. Uh, you can follow along on the screen or in the service sheets if you've printed them off. Colossians chapter 4, verses 7 to 18. Tychicus, a loved brother, a faithful servant, and a fellow slave in the Lord, will tell you all the news about me. I've sent him to you for this very purpose so that you may know how we are and so that he may encourage your hearts. He's with Onesimus, a faithful and loved brother, who is one of you. They will tell you about everything here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you as does Mark, Barnabas's cousin, concerning whom you've received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And so does Justice, who is Jesus, who is called Justice. These alone of the circumcision are my co-workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a slave of Christ Jesus, greets you. He is always contending for you in his prayers, so that you can stand mature and fully assured in everything God wills. For I testify about him that he works hard for you, for those in Laodicea and for those in Herapolis. Luke, the loved physician, and Demas greet you. Give my greetings to the brothers in Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it read also in the church of the Laodiceans and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. And tell Archippus, pay attention to the ministry you've received in the Lord so that you can accomplish it. This greeting is in my own hand, Paul. Remember my imprisonment. Grace be with you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, there's an outline there in your service sheets or on the screen. You can follow along, take notes. If you have any quest- questions as you send in your registration, please include them using the comments box at the bottom of the page. Well, how do you finish a letter like Colossians? Think back over some of the themes and concerns and concepts we've looked at over the last few weeks. Transfer and transformation because Jesus is able. The truth that Jesus is Lord is enough. The work of people like Paul and Timothy for the whole of God's mob across time and geography. The warning about false teaching that says Jesus is Lord is not enough. The clear command to walk with Jesus as Lord, the exhortation to live as you are, the whole wonder of putting off and putting on life as God's community where grace rules and lives, the truth that we're individuals in community and the emphasis on looking out with salty language and prayer for doors to be opened. How do you finish a letter that talks of such deep and lofty topics? Oh, if it was me, I'd finish with a rallying cry, oh, walk worthily of the Lord, or perhaps a searing expose about apathy, or a turn to the goodness of lifting our eyes above, or some inspiring statement about the rule and the grace of Jesus. Thankfully, Paul's not me, and that's not how Paul closes his letter. He closes with a series of greetings, connected with eight, nine people, several towns, and a series of personal requests and commands. In one way, it seems a strange, almost anticlimactic ending. One that seems vastly separated from the lofty and magnificent content of the rest of the letter. But several truths must cause us to pause and rethink this somewhat dismissive attitude. First, we've got to remember that other reading we had today from 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17, that all scripture is God-breathed that everything in the Bible is the word of God, that it's there from God for the benefit, the good, the growth, the discipling of his people. Seeing this is how Paul finishes the majority of his pastoral letters. There's something about this type of ending, more than just a convention, that Paul sees as a fitting way to finish letters as diverse as Romans and Colossians and Philemon. In fact, after Romans, the end of Colossians is the longest, most name-rich of all the letters. Third, there's a almost touchable, tangible, palpable warmth and generosity, fondness even, expressed in these words that really must prick our attention. What provokes such warmth and generosity, even amongst people who've never met each other? And fourth, the themes that we've loved and enjoyed, those that I opened with, 
are present here, even in the close of this letter. And so I want to suggest to you that this close to Colossians is a reminder of the real community of the Lord Jesus. It shows the reality, the geography, the history, the community of people who live with Jesus as Lord in his kingdom. Let me pray. Father, thank you that you save us into relationship, into community as individuals. Thank you that that community is with you first and foremost through your son, Jesus, and then with the rest of the community as a body with the head as Jesus. Father, as we finish with these words in Colossians 4, 7 to 18, please remind us of the good of that community, the warmth of that community across time and place and the obligation and relationship that goes with it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the structure of the passage is very clear. Verses 7 to 9 discuss the carriers of the letter, Tychicus and Onesimus. Verses 10 to 14 pass on in two sets of three the greetings of certain men. Verses 15 to 17 contains three commands that Paul wants to pass on to the Colossians. And verse 18 is the final flourish, the signature, the goodbye. And the best way to start in this section, is just to work through the passage, just as I've laid it out. <coughs> Excuse me. The first set of names are there in verses 7 to 9. Tychicus, a loved brother, a faithful servant, and fellow slave in the Lord, will tell you all the news about me. I've sent him to you for this, <coughs> excuse me, for this very purpose, so that you may know how we are, and so that he may encourage your hearts. He's with Onesimus, a faithful and loved brother, who is one of you. They will tell you about everything here. <coughs> Excuse me. Tychicus and Onesimus are the first names mentioned. They're the carriers of the letter, it seems. Uh, they've also been sent as news carriers. Paul sent them to Colossae, to people that Paul had never met, who'd never met Paul, for the express purpose of sharing news about Paul and Timothy so that the Christians in Colossae could be encouraged. Now, straight away, we get a bit of a glimpse into the closeness of the community of God's people. Even those who've never met eagerly seek news of each other so as to be encouraged. Atychicus, from what we know in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 20 verse 4, is a native of Asia Minor. He's a companion of Paul in Acts on at least one of Paul's missionary journeys. He's mentioned at the end of Ephesians, at 2 Timothy and Titus. He seems to be one of the two boys Timothy, Titus, Tychicus, that Paul relied upon. He's entrusted by Paul with letters, with responsibilities and messages. And Paul's description of him here is really a recommendation aimed at a group who probably have never met Tychicus. Paul's description here is incredibly strong and warm. Tychicus is a loved brother. He's a fellow servant, a fellow slave in the Lord. Under the lordship of Jesus, Tychicus is a closely regarded and highly held young man, fellow worker with Paul. It's very important here to see that Paul's not jealous of his work, is he? He's not protective of his turf. There are bigger issues and concerns than building little kingdoms or fiefdoms of ministry. Anisimus is a different kettle of fish to Tychicus. He's actually a local, one of you. He's the subject of the letter that was carried along with Colossians, Philemon. Now, as we read Philemon, and we might turn to that over the next few years, we gather that Onesimus is a runaway slave who fled to Rome, met Paul, became a Christian. Paul's now sending him back to Colossae and to his master, Philemon. It really is a remarkable situation. It's even more remarkable when you read Paul's description of this man here. Even in Philemon, he's a faithful and loved brother. What a turnaround for a former slave, a runaway, who had possibly the sentence of death hanging over his head. The source of the change is none other than the lordship of Jesus. It's only such a truth which can change people's identity and status so significantly. After all, he transferred someone like Anisimus, someone like you, someone like me, from the kingdom of darkness into his very own kingdom. It's only such a reality that can gather escaped slaves, wronged masters, former Jewish rabbi trainees and doctors into one community 
that forgives as the Lord Jesus forgave. Now Paul entrusts this odd couple with both letters, Colossians and Philemon, and with the job of sharing news to encourage the local believers in Colossae. The second set of names begins in verse 10, and it's really two sets of three. The first group, Aristarchus, Mark and Justice, are described as the only Jews, those of the circumcision, who are still working with Paul. It's an intimate picture of a man who has fought hard for the lordship of Jesus at great personal cost, great social isolation. But did you notice that he takes great comfort in these men, in the fellowship, in the work of the Lord with these three men? Isn't that just a wonderful word? Great comfort to me. Wouldn't it be great to be known as a community that gives comfort? Not a a comfortable community, but a community that gives comfort. A community that gives comfort. Well, Aristarchus was a companion of Paul on his missionary journeys. We can see that in Acts. Seems to have been a Macedonian and he seems to have been sharing Paul's imprisonment here, either by choice or because he was arrested at the same time. Mark's different again. Just like Onesimus was the odd one out standing next to Tychicus, so too Mark here. Mark, from what we knew, grew up with a Christian mother, Acts 12, verse 12. He even accompanied Paul on his earlier humanitarian missions, Acts 12, 25. Peter himself regarded Mark as a protege, even a son, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13. But this is the same Mark whose conduct split Paul and Barnabas in Acts 15. Paul at that time had severe doubts about Mark's character. And yet here, 12 or so years later, Paul and Mark are reconciled, a fact which Paul confirms in 2 Timothy 4.11, his last letter. In fact, this man Mark is responsible, we think, for one of the four accounts of Jesus' life that we still have, Mark's gospel. What a wonderful example of forgiving as the Lord forgave you, of restoration and reconciliation based on the grace we've received from God in our Lord Jesus. The last name here, Jesus or Justice, well, we don't know anything about him. Which brings us to the second group of three names, Epaphras, Luke and Demas. They're non-Jews. We've already met Epaphras. He's the man who brought the gospel to Colossae, his hometown. He's one of you, just like Onesimus. Moreover, by the way Paul describes his labour in prayer for this region, he might have been the bearer of good news to other towns in the area, perhaps to encourage the saints in Ephesus, even to spread the gospel in Herapolis. But he's not a one-hit wonder, this man. He continues to labour. He struggles with great intensity for the benefit of the churches that he's helped and established there in the Lycus Valley in modern-day Turkey. His desire, echoing Paul's mission in Colossians 1, 28 and 29, his desire is for their maturity, their perseverance in their walk with Jesus as Lord. Paul's strong recommendation of Epaphras seems a little strange if you stand it against the backdrop of his positive role in these towns. Perhaps... Paul's reasserting the importance of Epaphras against the backdrop of the false teachers, directing people back to what they'd heard, like Colossians 2, 6 and 7, back to the good news with which they'd started. Well, Luke's the same Luke that we meet writing Luke's Gospel and in the book of Acts. He wrote Acts as well. Uh, In terms of verses written in the New Testament, he's the largest contributor to the whole New Testament. And it's here that we're told he's a doctor. We don't know why, but we know how highly he's regarded because he's the loved physician. Demas is the last name. Like the previous two sets of names we've seen, this one stands at odds. By the time we reach Paul's last letter, 2 Timothy, we find that Demas has deserted Paul, 2 Timothy 4.10. And yet here, here he's still part of that support group. Now before we move on to the last two sections of this ending, It's worth noting that many of these names, in fact all of them except Justice, are mentioned at the end of Philemon. When we pause and we think about Paul's situation, the group of men and people around him, we cannot help but be struck by the amazing Bible study group that might have met in Paul's home under house arrest. Imagine the gatherings, 
Onesimus, a runaway slave. Tychicus, the go-to man. Timothy, who's been sent in numerous hard jobs. Mark and Luke and Paul, the contributors to the vast majority of the New Testament. Imagine the Bible study group. But notice the fellowship. It's warm. It's built on grace. It's a diverse group of men from different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different social standings, different education, different skills, different life situations who are bound together because they have one Lord Jesus who is enough. Well, the penultimate section of the letter focuses on three brief final commands that Paul has to be communicated into the Colossi church. The first command is one of greeting. The church in Colossae is not separate from Laodicea and the Christians who meet there in Nympha's house. Both are house churches, both are Christians, both share the same Lord. Paul's in fellowship with them and he wants the two groups to know that with each other. The second command gives an interesting insight into Paul's letter writing, the passing on of commands and the ministry he brings, perhaps even the beginning of an early doctrine of Scripture that blossoms out. The churches in Colossae and Laodicea have both received letters from Paul for the purpose of their encouragement. And these letters are to be exchanged. We, we don't have the letter to Laodicea. There's already an awareness by Paul here and his readers that his letters are for a wider consumption and need to be exchanged and perhaps even preserved. The final command is to Archippus. From Philemon we learn that he seems to be an elder or a leader in the Colossian church. He's to be reminded that he's got a job to do, a job given by God. He must fulfil it faithfully. The final section, verse 18, is Paul's closing comment. This greeting is in my own hand. Paul, remember my imprisonment. Grace be with you. (coughs) Excuse me. The letter's been by Paul and Timothy. His imprisonment weighs on him. (coughs) Excuse me. They're commanded to remember his plight, perhaps even the prayer request he had a little earlier. His desire for them is to remain like Colossians 2, 6 and 7, in the grace of God. Well, after that survey, what do we make of such a close? Let me finish by making three observations. I'm at point three on the outline. The first thing to observe is that this has the smell of reality, the feel, the taste of a real world, doesn't it? These are real people. We can trace them in history, across parts of the Bible, perhaps even in extant literature. They're real people in real relationships. They're interconnected across a wider community that has one identity because of the lordship of Jesus. There's real history here. There are places and people that we can plot and talk about and perhaps trace. One of the things we've got to remember about God's word is it doesn't occur in a vacuum. It happens in the real world. The crucifixion was a real bloody, dusty event. These early churches existed in real places with real relationships, very similar to the tensions we experience in our country towns, having lived there our whole lives. Please grasp the reality here. Second observation I make is the community that really exists. You can't avoid the warmth of the language here, can you? The warmth of the language about encouragement and hearts and comfort and faithful and loved brother and fellow servant and wrestling with great energy and perseverance in prayer. And and many of these relationships, real as they are between real people, are actually extended across boundaries where people actually haven't met each other. And they're bound together because they're in one community, one mob. The diversity of this community across social barriers across legal barriers, across geographical barriers, across ethnic barriers, encompassing towns and regions that were close but very different from Rome through to modern-day Turkey. People with different backgrounds, as we've mentioned earlier, different educational aspirations, different educational histories, different employment histories, all of these people wrapped together in a community, and it's marvellous, and it's warm, and it's caring. And it's encouraging, and it's sacrificing, and it's bearing, and it's forgiving, all because, and we'll come to that in a moment. But let me say that at the end of a letter of such immense theology, we need to recognise this truth. 
that theology does not preclude real, warm social relationships. Deep theology leads to deep community. And the two go hand in hand. If we are going to be a community that reflects the magnificence of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ and our Father in heaven and the counsel of the Holy Spirit, we need to have roots deep into the Bible. And that deep theology shared will lead to deep community enjoyed, proclaimed, observed and lasting. Which leads to the thing that ties them all together. The only way that such a real and diverse, warm, deep community could exist is because the Lordship of Jesus is enough. He is able to transfer and transform sinners from being at enmity with God to being servants of God. He is able to take people who are the enemies of God dead in sin and make them alive and they call God Father. He is able to take people, as we heard last year in Ephesians, from two different warring groups and make them one new community. The forgiveness of sins, the peace restored with God, the change of postcode, the putting on of the new man and the taking off of the old man, all because Jesus as Lord is enough. This is the binding ingredient that makes such a closing snapshot not only so appropriate, but also so heartwarming. Not only so relevant, but also a kind of mirror that our community might be able to hold up as God's mob here and say, Is that what we exhibit? Is that what we enjoy? Is that what we share? And uh, Jesus as Lord is enough. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, What seems like a tail end of a letter and a hodgepodge mix of greetings and people actually is a living, breathing example of the real and deep community that only comes because of the Lordship of Jesus. Father, make that the glue, the cement, the the bonding agent of this community of your people here in Narrabri so that not only do we display our transformation but others meet Jesus and are transformed too. Amen.